We now continue with the series Hold Fast in the next installment, Unless You Believed in Vain, which is a quotation that comes by way of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2, saying that this gospel that Paul has preached is the means by which we are being saved if we hold fast to the word that Paul preached to us unless we believed in vain. And that's a sad idea, to believe in vain. In vain, meaning for nothing, to, to no effect. It, it, you know, you believed, but for no reason. It didn't accomplish anything. You know, something came and, and ruined it for us. For us. So, um, you know, this is a scary thing, I think, and is worth considering. And that's why we're talking about hold fast. Uh, and we spoke about holding fast to the word, but I want to consider this idea about hardening the heart. And as he said, being believing, but believing in vain. There, There's an obedience there or a, a person who becomes a child of God, but, but it doesn't pay off in the end. And that's bad. You know, that's falling away. That's losing your soul. So we look at, first of all, um, Hebrews 3, which is quoting from Psalm 95 with regard to do not harden your hearts. In Hebrews 3 at verse 6, we're introduced to the idea Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, as opposed to Moses, who was faithful as a servant. But this one is a son. And we are the house of Christ, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Again, this is conditional. And uh, people, I know in the religious world, there's a lot of talk about salvation not being conditional. And, you know, they are not Christians. They don't know. They don't understand the Bible. You should not be troubled by that. But in the churches, you can see the same kind of attitude, even though nobody would well, maybe not nobody, but almost nobody would actually say once saved is always saved. Um, they'll just act like it because, you know, nobody's ever wrong. Nobody's ever in sin. There's no discipline. Nobody who's a Christian couldn't be in fellowship here. Why, he's a good old fella, right? That's how they act. But what the scripture says is that we do need to hold fast. And if we do so, then we are his house. If indeed we hold fast in, uh, our confidence and our boasting and our hope, uh, there is a condition there that we may not hold fast. We may let go. We may abandon. And that is the problem that he addresses in the 12th through the 15th verses. Take care, brothers. Again, believers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as, as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Well, we'll come back to this in a moment, but first take note in the 12th verse that we are brothers and yet in us there can be such a thing as an evil unbelieving heart and we can fall away from the living God, which is what he had said over in 1 Corinthians that you can believe in vain, uh, have it accomplish nothing, which is very bad. But rather we do this, we exhort one another every day or encourage one another every day as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. There's a hardening process there. It takes time, if you will, to fall away from God, to become uh, a faith that is vain. It, it's a process. And we're to be with one another or, or to encourage one another daily if possible. As long as it's called today, which is a different lesson entirely, but it's great to know that God is indeed the God of the present, not just the future <laughs> and the past, but of the present. Today is the day of salvation. If, if anything's going to happen, it's going to happen now. <laughs> uh, in some sense, now is all there is. I'm not saying um, everybody embrace hedonism. I'm saying reality. Everybody embrace reality. <laughs> 
You ever watch the news and say, can we just embrace reality? <laughs> but truth, there's only now, there's only today. And he says, we've come to share Christ if indeed, if indeed, we hold our original confidence firm to the end. It takes endurance. It, it takes uh, strength to do this, to live the life of the Christian. It can be done and it's well worth doing, but it is hard. As it is said today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. All right, so this opens an, an entirely new can of worms. <laughs> this is a quotation from Psalm 95. And I do want to take a look at the Psalm so we can understand and then I'm going to look at the things that it describes so we can understand even more better. <laughs> Psalm 95, 6 through 11. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He is our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. Forty years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. That's why I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Well, the psalm is fairly plain about this. He said... Hardening the hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa, when your fathers put me to the test. So there's some specific event here that we're talking about, Meribah, Massa. But it says they put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. And 40 years I loathed that generation. We're talking about the generation that came out of Egypt, that walked across the Red Sea. They saw his works, and yet they tested him ten times over. Until in Numbers 14, the condemnation comes down, that they're not going to go to the Promised Land after all. They're going to wander in this desert 40 years. That's what this is saying. There are people that go astray in their heart, they haven't known my ways. And in my anger, I swore they'll not enter my rest either. Though he saved a people out of Egypt, he afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Which is what Hebrews 3 is saying. They were unable to enter because of unbelief. Even though they had believed, certainly on the opposite shore of the Red Sea, as Egypt's bodies washed up on the shore, it, we are told they trusted the Lord. They trusted in his servant Moses. But before it's all said and done, they didn't believe anymore. They did not remain faithful and had believed in vain. So Hebrews continues this, and we'll get back to the Numbers 14 episode. But Hebrews 3, 16 to 19, who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Says Hebrews. It's reasoning with us. Who were they who heard and yet rebelled? What is Psalm 95 talking about? Wasn't it all those who had left Egypt led by Moses? Yes, it was that generation. With whom was he provoked for 40 years? Wasn't it those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? Yes, it's the wandering in the wilderness. It's that generation that left Egypt and was not faithful and therefore was condemned. To whom did he swear they wouldn't enter his rest, Psalm 95? But to those who were disobedient. We see then they were unable to enter because of unbelief. And yes, um, the New Testament equates disobedience and unbelief. They're the same thing. But to whom did he swear? The, the question in Hebrews uh, 3, 16 through 19 is who? Who heard and rebelled? With whom was he provoked? To whom did he swear they would not enter his rest? The reason for being so pointed about it is to say this is not about the world. It's not about the nations. This is about the people of God. This is about us. 
We have to reckon with our God. We have to be strong and persevere to the end. And these were unable to enter because of unbelief. They did not continue to trust in God. And how do you know? Well, because they didn't do what he said. That's how you know. They don't trust him. They don't believe him because they don't do what he says. And that's, you know, it seems uh, too simple. It seems simplistic. (laughs) But, you know, the gospel is always that way. It seems too simple. Like, well, this can't be. How can it be this simple? Why doesn't everybody believe it? Well, they don't. And yet it is simple. The reason is because it's a heart issue, not a logic issue. These are unable to enter because of unbelief. When they're not doing what God says, it's because they don't trust God. It's very simple. So when Christians uh, begin to dabble in sin, if you will, and Christians begin to live like the world, that's faith going away. That's the dwindling, a loss of their faith. They're entering into this problem of being disobedient to him after having been saved. So we go over to Numbers 14 and look at this account. A few of these, which is fine. But Numbers 14, uh, it's 26 down to 35. A bit of a reading here. Sorry, that is right. Okay. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, how long will this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. You know, the Lord said, this is a wicked congregation. What congregation is it? It's the people of Israel that have been pulled from Egypt that are in the desert at Sinai and and beyond. That is what God says is a wicked congregation. You know, congregation, congregare, that is Latin. And it it just means coming together, which is in Greek is synagogue, um, or um, in Greek uh, politics is ekklesia. Uh, So that's coming together, coming out from your place to be joined up together for some purpose in in public. That's... That's what it is. It's the church. (laughs) This wicked church grumbles against me. It's true. If we as Christians fail to keep the commandments of God, we are a wicked congregation and our complaint is with God. He said, I've heard their grumblings, which they grumble against me. See, we think that our complaint is with the people and it's always that way. You know, every division is about some fella or some lady, you know, personalities. They always want it to be personalities. Um, People don't want there to be any cause or any fault uh, or any reason to draw lines or to condemn. And yet they're dividing a church. (laughs) They want to wipe their mouth and say, I've done nothing. I've done no wrong. But that's not true. It's obviously not true. Don't be ridiculous. They're grumbling against God. The complaint is with God and his word that they don't want to be subject to. Now he continues, tell them, Moses and Aaron, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have said in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness. And of all your number listed in the census, 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, not one will come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb and Joshua, because they were the two spies who brought a good report and tried to encourage the people. But your little ones, who you said would become a prey, I'll bring them in and they'll know the land that you have rejected. As for you, your dead bodies will fall in this wilderness and your children will be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years. Your children will suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. That is very much the case. 
The fact is, we're hurting our children when we are not faithful to God. It is those who learn from us, those who look up to us, those uh, over whom we exert an influence or those whom we teach, those who are being subject to us, if you will. They, they're the ones who suffer when we do wrong. And that's always true. They suffer for your faithlessness until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. And that's a very dark and a sad thing, but it's kind of, it is what it is. He's saying, you know, when will you get out of the way? You're a dead weight. Let faithfulness reign. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, a year for each day you will bear your iniquity 40 years, and you will know my displeasure. I, the Lord, have spoken. And when he says this, when he says, you will know my displeasure, it means you, you get the measure of this. You get the depth of it. You have, you know, 40 years to contemplate the 40 days of the spies who went out to see the land, who should have come back with an encouraging report and did not. They discouraged the people and kept them from going forward. And this is the result. Surely this will I do to all this wicked congregation who are gathered together against me. In this wilderness, they'll come to a full end. There they shall die. When we say in this wilderness, they come to a full end. That's very, very sad. That's the full end. That's the end of the story. You know, full stop. They didn't get any farther than this. There isn't afterlife. There isn't heaven, if you will, for them. Well, I guess there's afterlife. There's after death, I guess, is what it is more like. It's, it's condemnation in hell. But this is the place where they come to a full end, wandering in the wilderness, in the ancient Near East desert somewhere. That's where they fell. That's really sad. A people who came out of Egypt by great signs and wonders, by the strength of God's right hand, they were pulled from the furnace only to believe in vain, only to give up on the way, to lose their trust in God that it can be done, that, that they can overcome, that there's no such thing as odds. <laughs> the odds are against you, but it doesn't matter. God doesn't, doesn't need odds. He doesn't play. Well, the other thing that was said in Psalm 95 is unable to enter because of unbelief in Hebrews 3 shows up in Psalm 95 by way of Massah and Meribah. These are the waters. And there are two accounts. There's Exodus 17 and Numbers 20. And uh, we'll look at Psalm 106 for a commentary on that. It's a short commentary. But there are two incidents. One in Exodus 17, when they've just come out of Egypt. The one in Numbers is pretty far down the line. But this one, Exodus 17, 1 to 7, we should look at this because we're in danger in the same way that they were in danger. That's the point of this. When he tells us in Hebrews that, you know, we need to hold firm, that we need also to encourage one another that we uh, take to heart that we don't want there to be an unbelieving and an evil heart departing from God. Today, as it is written, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. That calls on us to understand the rebellion. What did they do? All right, so... Um, that's why we're looking at this in a little bit more detail. Exodus 17, 1 through 7. The congregation of the people of Israel moved. They were moving as a camp, you know, through the desert as God instructed them. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? 
And I've put this into verse here um, because I think it is verse. Just like the condemnation of the Lord in Numbers 14, I think is verse. This also is verse. And the reason is because it's one thing to quarrel with Moses. Are you going to argue with the servant of the Lord? And when you are in some sense a fellow servant, although actually um, Moses is a chosen representative of the Lord and we ought to listen to him because he has revelation from God. But it's another thing altogether to put the Lord God to the test. And that's the meaning of it being adverse because, you know, Hebrew poetry uh, always has the second line, um, you know, making it stronger or more emphasized, you know, putting some contrast there for clarity of understanding. Right? They work together. They comment on one another. And so this is an uh, escalation. It's one thing to argue with Moses. It's another thing to test God. Why are you doing this? You shouldn't be arguing with Moses, but really, why are you testing the Lord? What do you think is going to come of that? But the people thirsted for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? <sighs> well, who brought them up? And why did he bring them up? to kill us, our children, our livestock with thirst? Hmm. I don't think that's why they did this. That doesn't sound right to me. Uh, oh, right, yes. Wasn't it because Pharaoh was murdering their infant born, you know, their newborn infant males and the people were being exterminated and forced into hard labor such that they were dying of exhaustion and other things? And they were snatched out of that furnace to worship and serve the Lord, their God, in freedom as their own nation. <laughs> yes, it was that. It wasn't to come out here and die of thirst. I remember now. It's a little blip, blip of the memory there, right? So Moses cried to the Lord, what shall I do with this people? They're almost ready to stone me. And it's true. They're ready to kill Moses, who only has good news. <laughs> And the Lord said, pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. So they, they know the staff. They know that he struck the Nile. They saw that. So now he goes and he's got the staff again. The elders are with him. He's doing it in the sight of the people. Why? To make it clear. Behold, I stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, says the Lord to Moses. You will strike the rock and water will come out of it. And the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Um, this follows the pattern of the other accounts of what he told Moses what to do before Pharaoh. It immediately follows with, and Moses did so. So he's just doing what he's always done. He called the name of the place Massa and Meribah. Massa. Because Massa means testing. And Meribah, because Meribah means arguing or quarreling, which seems too flowery for American English. Yes, he called the place testing and arguing because of the arguing of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? And there you have it. This is what they were really saying. Is the Lord among us or not? <laughs> did he come out of Egypt with us? Well, if he did, then, you know, where's all the, you know, where's all the, the gold? Where's all the, the architecture and the art? Where, you know, the, 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 the water, the greenery, you know, where's all the glory of this world? Why, you know, how are we supposed to think that God is with us and here we are wandering in a desert? Right. Is the Lord among us or not? When things stop going, you know, your way and you have an evil, unbelieving heart, this is what happens. You begin to wonder, well, you know, is it worth serving God? Is, there, is it worth paying the price to serve him? 
Is he with us or not? I mean, is this really what it's like to be a child of God? This, this is it? That's what people think when they're falling away. If these thoughts are in your mind, you're falling away and you're in grave danger. If you come with me over to Numbers 20, the other account. We find there again, there's no water for the congregation, verses two through five. They assembled against Moses and Aaron, which is not true. It's really God that they're mad at. They just think it's Moses and Aaron. And the people argued with Moses, oh, we wish we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. You understand what that's talking about? <laughs> that's talking about Numbers 14. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Now, when God, you know, caused the, the ground to open up and swallow them alive down to the pit, the people blamed Moses and said to him, you have killed the people of the Lord. So they lost their vision. They were not seeing clearly. They were not thinking clearly at all. It should have been abundantly obvious that the ground doesn't open up and swallow God's children down to hell alive. That happens to people who are not God's children. That should be obvious, but they didn't get it. And they're still not getting it. Oh, we wish we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Really, it would be better to be in hell right now than it would be to whatever you're going through in life, whatever. It, it's not as bad as hell. You don't want that. And why so much loyalty to these people on earth? Where's the loyalty to God? Isn't he the one whom we trust? Isn't he the one who saves us? Why have you brought out the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we should die here, we and our cattle? God called them a wicked assembly. Why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Nobody made you come out of Egypt. <laughs> the Lord saved you out of Egypt. Why did you obey the gospel? Did you want to be forgiven? Did you, did you realize you were lost? Or were you just trying to please somebody else? Conform to standards or norms. Well, yeah, that's a recipe for disaster. You don't want that. But if you understand why you are baptized and why you need to be baptized, this shouldn't be coming up. Why have you made us come out of Egypt? Well, no, we, nobody made you become a Christian. You obeyed the gospel. You made a promise to God. It's no place for grain or figs or vines or pomegranates. There's no water to drink either. Right. You... Did you really obey the gospel thinking that, you know, this was going to be the way to gain this world's goods and riches to have an easy, pleasant life? That's not the promise of the gospel. And you might have those things, you know, in our nation, you have as good a chance as any human being does. <laughs> but that's not the promise of the gospel. The gospel is for forgiveness. We need to be saved. We need to be rescued from condemnation. Well, the seventh verse continues. The Lord spoke to Moses, take the staff, assemble the congregation, you and Aaron, tell the rock before their eyes to yield its water. In this way, bring water out of the rock for them. Give drink to the congregation and their cattle too. And Moses took the staff from before the Lord as commanded, Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and pause for just a moment. What's different here from Exodus? <laughs> Exodus said, as the Lord had commanded, so Moses did. That's not what this says. Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock and said, here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their livestock too. 
But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe in me, to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. And he say he didn't believe in him. Well, how is that? Well, there's two things that happen here that tell you that this is a problem. Well, there's three, right? One is, of course, the formula. It didn't say, as, Mo- as the Lord commanded, so did Moses. It didn't say that. But number two, here now, you rebels, shall we bring water for you out of this rock? What do you mean we? <laughs> the Lord is the one who brings water, not Moses and Aaron. And the third thing is what God said to do was take the staff, take the others, but speak to the rock. And that's not what he did. He hit it twice. Kind of implies that it didn't work the first time, which should have taught him. (laughs) Oh, yeah. What God said was, I don't know, that's supposition, but we know that he was supposed to speak to the rock, not to strike it. That's how he didn't uphold the Lord. This is a problem. This is a sin. It's wrong that he did this because he didn't treat God as holy in front of the whole uh, congregation. This then is the water of Meribah arguing where the people of Israel argued with the Lord and through them, he showed himself holy. Through Moses and Aaron, he showed himself holy is what it means. Even Moses and Aaron did not enter the promised land. Moses was allowed to look at it, to see it from afar off, but he was not allowed to enter. And you say, well, it's just one thing. It's just one. He lived so long and he was so faithful to God. It's true, but he sinned in this matter. He did not treat God as holy. He let it get to him. And you can do this as a Christian He's so tempted to take it personally, and it's very hard to believe it, but the Bible is telling us quite plainly, it is not personal. They do not know what they are doing. It is God that they're mad with. It is God that they reject. It's not you. Time and time again, we're told, you know, Samuel had the same thing. He was sad about the people asking for a king, and God said, Samuel, it's not you they've rejected. It's me they've rejected from being their king. It's true. Over and over, the Bible shows us this is not personal. But Moses and Aaron started taking it personally. They were getting hurt. They were getting tired. They let it get to them. I'm not saying that I blame them. I'm not saying I'm better than they are. I'm just saying, let this be a warning to you. Through them, he showed himself holy. God will be treated holy. And what we do matters at all stages of life. Psalm 106 comments on this matter in verses 32 and 33. The people angered Moses at the waters, or I'm sorry, angered God at the waters of Meribah. And it went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter and he spoke rashly with his lips. That's the commentary that tells you what happened. He should not have said, we are doing this. God is doing it. He condemned them as rebels when God wanted him to speak to the rock and bring forth water. He had no instruction to get after them. He had no instruction to call names, and he certainly had no cause to take credit to himself for their salvation. But it says, they angered God and it went ill with Moses on their account. They made Moses' spirit bitter and he spoke rashly with his lips. And you know, Hebrews 13 comments on this too. You know, uh, to be subject to your leaders, you know, they give an account as those who watch over your souls and let them do this with joy and not groaning for that would be of no benefit to you. This is, that's what happened. They made things hard on Moses and his spirit did become bitter and he did speak rashly and it did cost him. He did not enter the promised land. So be on your guard, all of us. Finally, 1 Corinthians 9. 
The other side, um, you know, from Paul is in 1 Corinthians 9, the other way of looking at this, which is run to win. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 said, don't you know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run it to win. Or if you insist on terrible translation, so run that you may obtain it. <laughs> it's like one of those memes where they do the flowery language and turn very simple things into really long statements, you know. I think those guys are our translators sometimes. So run that you may obtain it. Run to win. That's what that means. Why are you in the race? Don't you want to win? Run like it. Tenth chapter. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers. Our fathers did all these things that you read about in these first few verses, right? That they, you know, they were baptized into Moses and the cloud and the sea, right? They, they did all of these works, the things that we read about in the Exodus and in the Numbers. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Drinking water from the rock, that was the waters of Meribah, the waters of Massa. That was Christ, it says. They, he was their life. Even then, they didn't know. But Jesus says, you know, to him who overcomes, I give the water of life freely. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. That's verse 6. What he's saying, I think, rather plain. You're in a race. You need to run so as to win it. Don't you understand? That generation came out and died. They partook of all these things. They were baptized. They had the spiritual food of the manna. They had the spiritual drink of the rock. But God, nevertheless was not pleased with most of them. They were overthrown in the wilderness. He's saying being a Christian is not enough. Being a faithful Christian is what you're called to do. These things took place as examples for us so that we wouldn't desire evil the way that they did. We're supposed to take an example from it. And that's where the 11th and 12th chapters land, or verses land us. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 to 12. These things happened to them as an example but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. It is a real warning. It is a real warning. We could fall. We could lose our faith in God. You know, it's a process, but when you start to get, you know, grumpy and complaining, you start to feel like, hey, it should be better than this. Where is my... You know, peace, where's my blessing? Where's my rest? You know, is the Lord with me or not? Is this really what it's like to be a Christian? You know, these kinds of thoughts, they're leading you away from God. That's not the way to stay a Christian. That's not the way to stay faithful. And that is not the road that leads to heaven. This is written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. That was a prior age. It had its reasons, it had its purposes, and its imperfections too. But we're in the final age. This is the end. There's no more There's no more law. There's no more salvation. Nothing else is coming. This is it. And this was written for our instruction. It's an example. Let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Well, it doesn't mean you walk about in, in uh, mortal terror, always worried that God is waiting to trip you up and knock you down to hell. That, that's not the God that we serve at all. But you do need to understand that that people left Egypt. They walked in the desert. They crossed the Red Sea as on dry land. They ate the manna. They drank the rock. And they died anyway. That's what he's saying. They died anyway. They were not faithful to him. When it came time to take the promised land, they said, we are not able. They're too strong for us. Well, 
it's like all of the devil's lies. It's half true. <laughs> we aren't able. The world is too strong for us. But God is able. And Jesus said, take heart. I have overcome the world. In me you have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. It's half true. The world is too strong for us. We can't beat it ourselves. But with God, all things are possible. When you obey the gospel and when you become a Christian, when you rely on him, he helps you. He blesses you. And you can overcome and you can be saved. So these are the lessons. Uh, you know, again, th this is the summary if you will, for what happened over there in Hebrews 3. The idea of do not harden your hearts as they did in the day of rebellion. It's a warning for us. And that's why Paul said what he did. You stand in this, you're saved in this, unless you believed in vain. We have to hold on, we have to hold fast through life. Uh, it is a rough ride. <laughs> uh, it, it can be difficult. But you have to be faithful to God and know that it's just a short time and God will reward you. You will reap in due time, though you may not see it here. And there may be a great injustice here in this world, but, and there certainly is. But in the end, God will reward you and it will have been worth it to serve him, to be faithful to him. If you need our prayers today, if you're a Christian who hasn't lived right with God, let us help you with our prayer on your behalf. All of us are subject to what we're reading here today. I don't say this to talk down to anybody. I, I'm, I'm right there with you, having my own troubles and difficulties, and I need your prayers as well. Today, are you a Christian who has uh, not lived right? You need to repent in the heart, but let us pray with you too. Have you obeyed the gospel yet? Are you even a Christian to begin with? Well, you can't do this alone. You weren't meant to do this alone. The Lord has help for you if you will obey him. We have water here and garments. We, we've done everything we can to make it as easy as possible to obey the gospel of the Lord. If today you need to obey or you need the prayers of the saints, let that need be known by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected. <laughs>